Tanya for organizing and putting uh, this, uh, this day together. Uh, and also thank you to Northumbria University for, for hosting this event. Um, do I need a microphone or am I loud and clear also in the back? Okay, thank you. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is the relation between hazardous waste and corporate crime. Uh, what I will discuss is a particular example of brown crime or hazardous waste crime, and that is the blending of chemical waste products, uh, sometimes toxic, sometimes not. Uh, it's a regular business process, blending different chemical products together uh, in order to produce a new chemical product that can be used, uh, but sometimes it's heavily toxic. I'll explain a little more um, later on. But in discussing this particular type of crime, uh, I will bring together strands of my own work and uh, connect with uh, that of others. What I would like to discuss is the very problematic nature of legal enforcement against this type of crime uh, in the first part of my presentation and then I will move on to uh, discussing the potential of some extra legal types of enforcement, in particular uh, uh, adverse publicity and naming and shaming. Um, that's a topic that I've published quite extensively about and I've become rather pessimistic about the possibilities but I'll try to end up with uh, uh, some positive notes and maybe connecting with uh, the previous speaker on social justice, which is a very inspiring start of the day, I think. Well, to be a bit more specific about what I mean with hazardous waste blending, uh, when we talk about chemical waste, uh, sometimes it's waste that needs to be uh, disposed of, that needs to be uh, processed in an environment friendly way, but it's also possible sometimes to recycle it, to mix it with another product, to uh, obtain a new uh, useful product. So that's of course a very good way to dispose of your chemical waste, to process it and to make it into something new and useful. So that's a regular business process that's happening throughout the world, um, in chemical facilities uh, everywhere, in particular uh, in my country, in the area that my university is located in, the Rhinemont area in Rotterdam. Rotterdam Harbor. But this process can also be used, as you can imagine, to conceal uh, toxic chemical products because when they're blended in uh, other chemical products, it becomes a new product and it's difficult to see what was exactly in it. Um, this is often happening uh, in the context of fuel or different kinds of fuels. Uh, for example, bunker, bunker oil in the shipping industry, a fuel for ships. Uh, toxic waste is being blended into bunker oil uh, and then it's being used as a fuel for ships, it's burnt and nobody can ever uh, establish anymore what was exactly inside it, but the toxic waste uh, ends up in the sea or on the shores or in our fish. So this kind of um, in between legal and illegal activity, it's not always easy to determine whether it's illegal, um, but I will focus on, on the criminal kind of it, so really the illegal blending toxic waste into other products uh, can be done in chemical facilities on land, but you can imagine um, uh, when it concerns uh, cons act actively concealing toxic waste, it's very attractive to, attractive to do it on the sea because it's less visible. Uh, so this type of crime often happens in the shipping industry, uh, around the world, uh, on ship cleaning vessels uh, at the sea, uh, and in West Africa it's particularly I would like to, to be able to imagine uh, what it looks like to show you a very short clipping, about one or two minutes, a uh, short fragment made by the Dutch uh, documentary program uh, Zemla. Uh, what I will show is images made by a whistleblower, so somebody who is active in this blending industry. Uh, part of it is, is comments in Dutch uh, and part of it is in English, so I think you will, and you will see it, you'll understand. You will see several ships. Uh, loaded with chemicals waiting to be unloaded um, on the west coast of Africa. One by one they will be pumping, uh, arriving at the main vessel and pumping their load into uh, that ship. And uh, it's then blended into other materials and part of it, as you will see, is dumped in the sea. I hope it's going to work. Amerikaanse oliewereld. Arend van Kampen maakte zichzelf tijdens werkzaamheden voor oliebedrijven. We zien everywhere all these pots, you see? 
tientallen schepen liggen met afval aan boord langs de kust van Nigeria voor anker. Ze wachten op één voor één verlost te worden van hun afval. Er zijn restante afgewerkte benzine, gasolie, diesel en scheepsafval. Die ladingen worden vervolgens bij elkaar gepompt op één schip. Het personeel werkt zonder enige vorm van bescherming met de partijen afval en afgewerkte olie.
So corporate crime is always discussed about in terms of ambiguities, and these ambiguities are also particularly relevant for the, the, the blending and mixing of uh, material that we're talking about here. Um, and one of these ambiguities has to do with the nature of the product waste, because a waste is something negative that's very costly to dispose of, but it can be transformed in something useful, into a new commodity. Uh, and then a lot of profit can be made because then you can sell it. So this dual ambiguous nature of the product waste um, um, creates the difficulty or the necessity for regulatory authorities to dist distinguish when something is waste and when something uh, is a useful product. And that's also often very difficult to assess because in different countries around the globe there's different values attached to products. For example, fuels that we in Western Europe don't consider uh, useful because they smell too much or they're too polluting <coughs> can be perfectly useful in, for example, Africa, uh, where um, expectations are a bit different. Uh, so that makes <coughs> it difficult to distinguish and to determine whether a product is a legal or an illegal product or a, a useful or a hazardous product. That's one type of ambiguity. Um, that also creates uh, different kind of legal ambiguities. For example, which country is responsible for enforcement against hazardous waste? Uh, is it the country that produces or exports the product or the country where it's being used? And particularly, of course, when you are at the sea, it's even more difficult to determine who, which country has jurisdiction. Within a country, it's also very complicated to determine what authority uh, is responsible for enforcement. For example, in the Trafatura case, there was the Municipal Authority of Amsterdam, there was National uh, Enforcement Authorities, there was the Criminal Justice Department, there was uh, the Environmental uh, Regulator, there was the Maritime uh, uh, <coughs> Authority, there was Customs, and there was the Coast Guard. And it took a few weeks for them to figure out um, who was capable and had the authority to, uh, to enforce against Trafford Lure and APS. And eventually it, it took six years of legal battle in court to determine who was uh, had the authority. So, a lot of legal ambiguities and problems. Another problem stems from the fact that environmental crimes um, <coughs> are different from, from uh, well, street crimes or normal crimes because they can be conceptualized as crimes of omission. Uh, when you commit a regular crime, for example, when you break into a house or when you kill somebody, you need to act, you do something in order to to commit the crime, but many environmental crimes uh, consist of not doing anything, uh, not processing waste adequately, for example, or not uh, taking preventative measures. So it's actually crimes of doing nothing, crimes of leaving action behind. And that makes it difficult to enforce because it's very easy uh, for the offender uh, to think about um, uh, neutralizations or excuses. I didn't know that I had to do that, or it was too expensive, or uh, was too complex. So uh, the whole idea of a crime of omission requires a bit of a different approach, which also creates uh, ambiguities. Well, as you can imagine, as often the case with environmental crime, uh, another type of ambiguity, ambiguity stems from the fact that it's invisible. Uh, sometimes with hazardous waste you can smell it, but it's difficult to see, and therefore victims are uh, often unaware that the, their environment is being polluted or uh, they lack the power to stand up against big firms or uh, they are economically dependent on these firms and un unable to take action. And these ambiguities create very serious problems of deterrence and enforcement. As you can imagine, against these firms uh, who operate at the sea, there's very infrequent inspection. Not many inspectors go around uh, and actually come to check what's happening there, and that leads to a low uh, deterrence. Our case study that we performed contains many examples of uh, uh, waste processing um, where people didn't take any trouble in concealing what they were doing because they didn't see inspection or detection as a real, uh, 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 a real possibility. So uh, active deception of inspectors, for example, was hardly taking place. They just did what they, what they uh, regularly did, and they, they didn't really calculate in that they would be inspected. So that's detection problems. Um, 
often when multiple companies are involved, as you saw in the pictures, there's various ships uh, involved that are transferring waste one to the other, so there's different companies. It's very easy to point at each other as being culpable. Um, uh, so the, the, ship, the owner of the ship can blame the captain, for example, or um, the supervisor can blame its personnel. So uh, it's very difficult to determine uh, in a legal setting who is culpable of a crime in the event that a crime is being detected. And when it's detected and a responsible person or institution is found, it's also very difficult to prove the cause causality uh, of certain harms and the activities uh, that went before. For example, in the Trafigura case, uh, Trafigura acknowledged that people in Abidjan became very sick. It was easily to see that. Uh, but they said, well, there has to be another cause because the waste cannot, can never be the cause. So, uh, and it's very difficult to prove. Um, well, as you probably all are aware of, sanctions for environmental crime are really low, in particular uh, when we talk about these global uh, firms who are often very uh, successful. Uh, uh, sanctions are low. Most cases settle uh, and do not come for criminal court. Um, so uh, they really uh, are um, uh, quite undeterred. Uh, in the Porco Pala case, for example, uh, Trafigura, the company, was eventually sentenced after six years and they had to pay a fine in uh, the Port of Amsterdam sentenced them to pay a fine of 1 million uh, euros in 2012. And in that same year, uh, Trafigura had a great year of performance because they made a net profit that was almost $1 billion. So that million fine um, was not a real problem for them. Personal liability, their CEO, uh, Claude Dauphin, he settled with uh, the court in Amsterdam for 67,000 euros. Well, for his salary, that won't be a real problem. One Christmas present less, maybe. Uh, and I should add that they had to pay uh, civil damages to the victims in Abidjan, uh, but also that has not given the company a real blow because it's an extremely successful company. Their uh, annual turnover is 45 billions, um, so uh, they can lose some money in settling with, uh, with, with victims. And that also illustrates uh, power imbalances um, with these global firms and the countries that are supposed to supervise them. Uh, if you realize this turnover of Trafigura, 45 billion, um, Ivory Coast has an annual uh, uh, gross national product of 18 billion. Um, uh, Trafigura has offices in, uh, in uh, I think, 81, 81 offices in 56 countries all around the world. Uh, it has its uh, base in its legal base in Amsterdam because of the lenient tax regime in the Netherlands. But uh, you can imagine that it's really. Um, a different of difference of power between uh, a country like Ivory Coast and such a powerful global firm. Well, because of these various problems of uh, enforcement, um, you can imagine that uh, these large global firms uh, are not easily to be deterred by, deterred by formal enforcement. And in many cases, as our case study found out, uh, prosecution ends up by focusing on small firms, small violations, uh, and leaves the big firms um, untouched. Well, that's a very common problem um, with legal enforcement against corporate crime, of course. So the legal part of enforcement is unsuccessful, or at least not enough, to act actively uh, uh, work against these large global firms. And what is often suggested as a uh, alternative is adverse publicity or naming and shaming. And it's often thought that this will be, uh, in addition to formal legal sanctioning, uh, a very powerful extra punishment. Adverse publicity or naming and shaming offenders in the media can lead to um, individual publicity sanctions for firms, so it can cause reputational damage to them, which can cost them customers. Uh, it can also induce a shame for offenders when the CEO is being uh, mentioned in the press or maybe shown in a criminal trial, and the expectation is that that will deter them. And the second function of naming and shaming is not only individual sanctioning, but also sending out a moral message about what is right and wrong, uh, increase public awareness, and change perception.
perceptions about what kind of behavior is to be expected of uh, firms and what responsibility they have. Well, what I will argue in the remainder of this presentation is that this potential, although it sounds promising, is often unfulfilled for three reasons. First of them, reputation is not so important as often thought for global firms. Second, corporations uh, fight back against attacks on their reputation, so they create adverse, uh, positive publicity as a counter strategy. And third, because of the nature of media representation of corporate crime, it's not always negative, the publicity that's being generated. I'll illustrate that with some examples of the ways Prefigura dealt with publicity. First point, reputation is not so important as it is sometimes thought or uh, not so important as it maybe used to be. Uh, there's an interesting new book by Jonathan Macy, it's about Wall Street, so finance, a different topic, uh, but it's called The Death of Corporate Reputation, it just came out. And uh, Macy argues that on Wall Street, corporate reputation used to be a very strong regulatory mechanism because people uh, in banking and finance uh, feared for reputational damage and therefore uh, complied to the law and, and behaved responsibly. Um, but he says that's no longer the case because, again, three reasons. First, um, uh, corporate reputation uh, is being uh, unlinked more and more from individual reputation. So when you work for a, corp uh, for a corporation that has a, a bad press or, or that shows bad behavior, uh, that doesn't mean that as an individual you will be tarnished by that. And he gives many examples, for example, uh, Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm that accounted for Enron and did a very bad job and eventually um, went out of existence. Um, the individuals, the persons, the accountants working for Arthur Anderson, even in the departments that were directly involved with Enron, they got great new jobs and they are not ashamed of being an ex-Arthur Anderson person. There are even alumni clubs uh, and reunions. So it's really no uh, trouble for you to be an ex Arthur Anderson accountant doesn't work against you. So your individual reputation uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not affected by corporate misbehavior. Second, what he argues is that uh, a public reputation in the media may be something very different from your reputation in the particular private closed business community that you're working in. For example, Goldman Sachs, uh, their CEOs and leaders are being uh, portrayed in the media as criminals maybe, but in the closed private community of banking, uh, these CEOs are still very, uh, have still very positive images. They may be in trouble in the outside world, but inside they're viewed as people who made a lot of money and who creatively solved a lot of problems and who came out of problems not too bad. So um, uh, in the business community, things can look different. Third, what he argues interestingly, is that uh, maybe a criminal trial is still very stigmatizing, but there have been so many civil settlement, settlements and so many administrative fines that people have become used to them, and it's not longer um, uh, something you should be ashamed of. They have lost their stigma. Um, and maybe it's still the case for a criminal trial, but uh, for administrative penalties, it's just inconvenient and a, a, a sum of money that you have to pay. Now, this is what he argues for Wall Street, which is a very different uh, type of business than these global uh, commodities firms. But we can ask ourselves if this is the case for financial sector where reputation used to be really important, uh, would it be so different for uh, commodity trading where firms are much less dependent on a reputation for responsibility and reliability than in finance? So I think there is a lot to say in this argument that reputation, corporate reputation, is maybe less important than we always think. Second reason why our high expectations about naming and shaming and adverse publicity may not be um, present in reality is that, of course, corporations do not sit still uh, against the tax to their reputation. Um, they they uh, fight back, uh, sometimes with positive news in the media, but sometimes also with examples of legal power play and one of the finest or worst, I think worst examples, is what happened in the Trafigura case. Uh, because um, Trafigura hired a, uh, a reputation management firm, Carter Rock. Um, and uh, Carter Rock uh, helped, helped Trafigura in a very uh, 
rather strong way because uh, in 2009, um, uh, uh, the British newspaper <coughs> Guardian had a, uh, obtained a report, it was called the Minton Report, uh, which was damaging for, uh, for uh, Trafigura. It was about the nature of the waste and the, the health problems in Abidjan. And what Carter Rock did was issuing an injunction against the Guardian, against the newspaper, forbidding them to publish, publish the report. Uh, and they also were, uh, uh, could not publish about this uh, prohibition, about this injunction. So it was a super injunction. They could not write anything about uh, this whole report. Then about a month later, uh, a member, member of the British Parliament wanted to ask questions in Parliament about this whole uh, injunction. And then the Guardian said to Carter Rock, well, we're going to write about that. At least we can report about what's happening in our Parliament. Uh, and then Carter Rock uh, said they would sue the newspaper um, and, um, because they would breach the injunction. Well, then the only instrument that uh, the Guardian had was to enter a tweet because that's uh, not uh, uh, an official newspaper publication. And this is it. It's by uh, the chief editor of uh, the Guardian. And that uh, eventually caused a lot of m internet community media attention. And then uh, in the course of events, Carter Rock was and Trafigura were uh, forced to uh, draw back uh, that injunction. But you see that this corporation has an extreme uh, uh, weapon in its hand and doesn't hesitate to, to use it against uh, the free media in a Western European country. I think that's a really an incredible example of corporate power play. And did it negatively affect Trafigura? Well, they're still very uh, successful. They haven't gone out of business because of this uh, behavior. So uh, they, still, they still flourish. Well, I'm going to give you my third argument why I think that adverse publicity is not always such a powerful instrument, and that's how the media work and how the media report about corporate crime, uh, environmental crime, sorry. Uh, first of all, they don't, uh, don't report about it that much. Uh, it's a subject that doesn't interest, it, that doesn't interest a lot of readers. Uh, uh, a study by Paul Svetetsky and his colleagues uh, of 544 cases of chemical uh, uh, toxic releases showed that only 1.5% of them were covered in the press and when they're covered uh, they're being, um, they're being uh, written about in a particular uh, frame as we call it, so a particular uh, lens and that's an, uh, often an accident lens, so uh, they were just, just accidents. And um, uh, um, so the whole structural part of it, the, the culpability, the cor culpability of the corporation, is um, getting a lot less attention. I would like to discuss two typical frames, one of which is the excellent frame, that we often see, and show you a little example of how Trafigura smartly used those. One uh, of the Typical frames that we find in media covering of environmental crimes is denial of harm. Corporations get a podium to uh, say that nothing uh, damaging really happened. For example, in the Trafiguro uh, case, uh, their CEO said, well, it was just a mixture of water and soda and with a very sweet French accent. It sounds like a nice recipe almost, uh, instead of a very toxic uh, blend. Um, well, I'll go through them quite quickly. Uh, victims are being given in the media sometimes less attention than the offenders themselves, who get a lot of opportunities to explain why they did nothing wrong. Uh, victims are also sometimes blamed as being partly guilty because they weren't careful or they're greedy, they're just out for uh, getting uh, compensation from the company. And uh, on the contrary, the offender is often portrayed as a victim of too stringent regulation or being a good employer. And if uh, they face enforcement, it will be bad for the economy. So that's one frame that we often see in media uh, portraying environmental, environmental crime. And the other one is the opposite. It's uh, not denying the harm, not denying that something has happened, but uh, instead of it confirming that it was very awful, but then denying all responsibility for it. Uh, we're not to blame. Uh, it was just a routine operation. It was an accident again. So uh, it wasn't our fault. I would like to show you a very small part of the interview that uh, Jeremy Paxson, uh, 
great interviewer, uh, but he didn't manage to really get through to uh, the PR strategy uh, and the frames that uh, Traffic Bureau Chairman Heli de Turkheim used. It uh, was on BBC News Live. It's about one minute. environment and, uh, and uh, while at the same time defending ourselves against completely unfounded uh, conversation. Let me take you briefly. Uh, I repeat my question. Why did you send this waste to Africa? So just listen to me briefly. I would like to give you the facts and, and then we, 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 we have will answer the question. First of all, the, the waste in question, the slots were a mixture of water, gasoline and caustic soda. Secondly, the, the discharge of slots is a routine operation which is carried out worldwide and Abidjan is a sophisticated force fully equipped to handle such waste. Right. Three, the uh, population of Abidjan has been suffering for a very long term polluted environment. This is so bad. Can you just. It goes on for five minutes, and when you go through the end, you see Jeremy Paxson asking the same question and Turkheim giving the same answer, so you see how, how it goes. And that's a, a very common, the denial of responsibility strategy that we know uh, corporations use a lot. Uh, another great book that I read this summer is about an oil company, ExxonMobil. It called, it's called Private Empire. It's also illustrating how powerful these uh, global companies are. They're empires in itself. And uh, what is sort of simply funny is uh, that it contains an example of how uh, this global oil company prepares for an oil spill, like it happened with BP. Uh, they have plans for that, and those plans, as the book writes, count uh, 10 pages for the recovery of the spill, uh, 5 pages for environmental protection, but 40 pages for media. And they have 13 different press standard press releases for how to deal with various uh, types of incidents. And I gave an example here of what their standard press release is for when a public fatality uh, happens, um, then ExxonMobil will tell you that they are greatly saddened by this tragic event and express their deepest sympathy to the families of those affected. We're working with fill in dots at the site, and in case a criminal charge is being uh, issued, uh, they will always say, We believe there are no grounds for such charges. This was clearly an accident. So, whatever happens, th this will be their answer. So, to conclude, is there no such thing as bad publicity? I've illustrated a lot of um, uh, aspects why it's very difficult to, um, to uh, um, create bad publicity as an extra pressure on firms. Um, I have no real solutions about how things could be better, but uh, as you can imagine, we really have to work from the from the bottom here, grassroots, with communities, communities, local communities, need to be aware of these problems, need to be involved to uh, actively work against corporations who pollute their environments. Uh, what's very important, as we have seen, is investigative journalism, like the documentary or newspapers, revealing these crimes. Uh, we're in Western Europe, but still, as we have seen with the Guardian example, independent media are extremely important. Um, uh, and internet is as well. We as criminologists, um, uh, I'm struggling myself with how to engage with this issue, how to uh, divide my time between the academic demands of publishing in peer-reviewed journals and at the same time um, yeah, also trying to play a role in media and working with communities uh, uh, as a scholar. Uh, there's a very inspiring example of people who have been able to do that, like Melissa Jarrett in North Texas. Uh, but what is most important, I think, and I, I would like to end with that, is the extremely important role of NGOs and environmental activists like Greenpeace, who really uh, can play with the media in a much better way uh, than governments think, I, uh, can, I think. And 
Greenpeace in the Trafalgar case played a very important role in asking attention uh, for this problem, but also in writing a very extensive and good research report. So it's a combination of research and activism uh, that's really indispensable against uh, these global problems uh, with a difficult legal uh, enforcement uh, uh, situation. So rather than ending as a real academic with academic conclusions, I would like to end with this image uh, as a sort of a tribute to an environmental activist that's behind bars now. It's uh, one of the Arctic 30 uh, uh, activists who, um, a Greenpeace activist, the Dutch uh, girl from Amsterdam, who's now being charged with piracy and facing maybe 15 years of prison. Um, well, just think about that and how important their work is. Thank you. Accidents uh, are a reactive uh, enforcement method of an inspection agency and is the responding of an agency uh, of cooperation with accidents and incidents. It's a more unpredictable and unstructured part of the work of uh, inspectors and corporations in the Netherlands are obliged to report exceptional incidents to the Dutch authorities. The focus of part of uh, this presentation is on these incidents and I will provide a short overview of uh, my uh, complete presentation. I start with four accidents I've uh, seen. I uh, continue with uh, the aim and research question today. And uh, I will place that in the overview of my PhD study. <coughs> An incident is most of the time reported uh, by a corporation. Uh, and in almost in all cases, someone of an uh, inspection agency will visit the spot to investigate themselves. The size of the corporation was not of influence here. All 15 corporations in my PhD study encountered uh, some unexpected incidents. Not all of these incidents lead to investigations due to several reasons. Some explanations were that the corporation did a thorough investigation themselves and found out that it was a human error uh, lead to a minor soil issue uh, leakage of uh, dangerous substances due to a small hole failure of equipment. Well, there were countless reasons. The incidents high highlighted today by me are selected on the basis of seriousness, severity of the accident and personal harm of employees. The first incident I would like to discuss briefly is the incident with a truck in uh, February 2000 that led to the death of an employee. And the truck is during the unloading of waste hazardous uh, products at the edge of a platform collapse into uh, 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 the tilting of the truck and fell down, which eventually uh, led to the personal harm. Uh, after the incident uh, investigation, they found out that the chemical corporation uh, did not take adequate measures such as clear instructions, there was an unsafe work spot, uh, <coughs> the danger of falling existed for one or more employees, and they knew this problem since a long time because it was already known to them in 1996. The chemical corporation could have known that a serious harm was to be expected there. The case resulted in a criminal conviction and a conviction of occupational health and safety records. Another uh, incident is uh, the incident, uh, well, it's not an exact picture of it, but uh, it was uh, in April 2006, and it was uh, like, uh, well, Judith uh, briefly mentioned before, an accident because the operations were of a normal device, 
and a big, uh, there was an emergency shutdown, so that was uncontrolled situation, and that led to uh, the, uh, the exposure of very dangerous substances. And uh, evacuation uh, started, and 15 employees were exposed to these uh, fumes. An OSHA inspector worked together with the uh, Sea Harbor Police during uh, the accident investigation. And this case again resulted in a criminal investigation and conviction of health and safety regulation. <coughs> Another incident I would like to draw the attention, which is some minor incident you can say, but it's also an example of the incidents I encountered during the study. And it was October 2008, by and was also uh, reported by the corporation itself. The picture with the blue uh, uh, thing on top of the roof is before the accident, and the picture on the right side with the gray one is after the accident. An operator of a nearby corporation, so somebody from another corporation on the same chemical site, uh, warned the concert corporation because they were smelling something typical. They checked it and they found the vacuum valve was leaking fumes. And then a thorough <coughs> investigation uh, uh, followed, and the cause was a hole caused by corrosion. The Occupational Safety and Health Agency decided in this case not to continue with the follow up investigation. They replaced the valve, and below you can see uh, that uh, the whole uh, part was uh, damaged by corrosion. The corporation invested money in it, uh, solved the situation, and therefore it was considered okay, it's finished. <coughs> Another incident was uh, more uh, difficult investigation. These are actual pictures from the criminal accident investigation that was uh, done by uh, multiple authorities. Sea Harbor Police, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Health and Safety Agency were involved. I will go briefly uh, to the first to the uh, left side. <laughs> um, it was an incident uh, that uh, uh, was reported by the corporation that multiple persons became unwell after inhaling a toxic corrosive gas. The corporation tried to downsize the incident with, for example, informing the authorities that it was not a long-lasting exposure to the substances. It was not so really, well, we will see if that's true. Because uh, you can see on the left here, there was overpressure that caused the release of this corrosive toxic gas and the exhaustion equipment was not connected. That's um, very important if you're working with chemicals, I think. Um, <coughs> the walking proof of the actual person here was shown on the right side. The green is the walking proof of the engineer. He, uh, he was just before the accident to release, walking towards here to check at the main panel to see what was going on. They didn't know, not really know. Somebody else was standing here, saw this guy uh, walking towards here, and the wind was blowing, which is important uh, when you're working with chemical substances on this side. So, in the end, the engineer who was just standing here got a full blast of the gas cloud that there. Well, it's no uh, surprise, I think, for you that the uh, case resulted in a criminal prosecution and conviction. These are just four accidents uh, uh, which I encountered during my PhD. Uh, and uh, it made me wonder because all of the corporation have ex uh, experienced accidents, so maybe due to normal working procedures, human error or the examples I explained before, but what is the effect of punishment after accidents on those concerned? And uh, are those involved in potential future accidents of the same type? Well, that I would like to address further. But um, 
I will show you the framework of the PhD because that's the broader context uh, when I uh, saw encountered all the accidents. I did participant observation uh, between 2009 and 2012. It was all uh, surveyo related uh, inspections and in the Netherlands that involves one uh, environmental protection agency inspector, one OSHA inspector, occupational health and safety agency, and one fire department inspector. It are joint inspections. And I viewed the whole process of 19 inspections with the preparation, the inspection days, the closeout uh, uh, among the inspectors, and the closeout at the corporation. And the 15 corporations are refineries, transportation, warehousing, uh, handling, substance. It was a total of 19 inspections. That means that I've seen uh, multiple inspections from certain corporations. So I've seen one inspection uh, for annual inspection of all 15, and some I saw two or three times because it's done annually. I had the uh, opportunity to view it again. <coughs> it uh, were 50 inspectors and uh, that was a mix of teams and uh, there were normal inspection and follow-up inspections. <coughs> um, I've seen different uh, parts of an inspection and what, what did I really uh, view as a participant observer? The walk all around of the corporation seems uh, maybe not so very interesting, but it was, I think, the most important, interesting part as a researcher. Because uh, inspectors are taking a detailed and closer look at installations, section, equipment, storage warehouses, signs, signaling uh, at the sites itself. You can see a difference between small and uh, large corporations. Small corporations, maybe the whole inspection takes just one day. But a uh, large corporation, you there for seven days maybe. But even then they decide in advance, okay, I will take this installation now, and the next time we will do another installation. Because they cannot see a uh, complete refinery in seven days. But then they can talk to people, ask questions, ask procedures. So that was really interesting. After that, it was uh, made most of the time a selection of a safety management system, which is obligated under spatial regulation and other subjects as well. <coughs> And that was like the fixed elements of uh, an inspection. And I had also some other interesting points of, from literature drawn and from uh, my own situation during the inspection that uh, is developed in a proactive reactive situation, relationship with other agencies, negotiations uh, that happened uh, while they were doing the inspection. And um, I would like to highlight one uh, uh, typical thing. Uh, an informant of a corporation told the uh, occupational health and safety inspector that he is shocked by the low level of process safety within the corporation. He urged the inspector multiple times to report the cases clearly in order to influence the upper management. And this is a typical situation that the enforcement relationship is symbiotic. Uh, the inspector needs somebody to give more insight into the actual practice of the working of the corporation. Otherwise, he, would have, he could have maybe estimated that it was really worse because the uh, involved inspection resulted in 10 major uh, violations. But he said afterwards, did I see just the top of the iceberg or is it even worse? And then this guy informed the inspector, it's even worse. So that is, uh, and it's not a small corporation, it's one of the largest in the Netherlands. So it's really 
something to be aware of, I think. <coughs> um, another issue I want to uh, bring up here in this participant observation part is that during the inspection in 2011, uh, the previous inspection of 2009 was still uh, existing. The corporation did sort of did nothing about it. And it was a topic related to the risk metrics. I will not go into detail with it, but it's a way of calculating risks uh, with working with dangerous substances. And um, the OSHA inspector told them, well, you receive uh, an enforcement notice on this issue. And then she asked the corporation if six months was a reasonable time to comply, because she wants a realistic time there. Although the, the violation existed for a long time, there was still some room to negotiate between the enforcement authority and the corporation. And then, in the end of the inspection, they agreed on this time period. But I've seen it multiple times that a, a corporation has violations.